quite a privilege to being able to make a big change in your life. You've got like, it's a big risk and not everybody can take it. All right. I know meetings is where like work is supposed to take place. Um, but am I the only one who thinks that nothing actually happens? I had to I sort of classify my career in BT as being half of it was a playground and the other half was a prison. But putting the people on the front line in charge of what they want to do with it to change and improve the way they work. It was all completely made up. But because we knew we were focusing on the things that matter and things were going in the right direction, it was fine to talk about it. And now you want to become a something completely different, in my case, a social entrepreneur. Um, so how do you reinvent yourself? We are in the act of becoming. We are continually reinventing and transitioning and developing. Mm. Is when you get in that corporate environment, you stop becoming. Other people identify you like that. And to escape from that label is quite hard. And then I was thinking, it wasn't like washing machine, was it? What, they weren't raging against the bread machine. They were raging against the corporate machine. Because suddenly... The things that I thought were important were no longer important and it just became really obvious to go and do something else. Welcome everybody to this episode of Work Punks. Work Punks are of course Colin Newlin of Decrepify Work, Ben Simpson of Vital Org, but we also have Michael Patterson as our special guest for today. Michael has a history in technology enabled change and uh, we're going to ask him to explain to us what that means and what he's been up to throughout his career. Um, and we particularly invited him also to share with us his experience in making a significant career change, um, because it's something that a lot of us are going through or have gone through in the past. So uh, plenty to find out about each other and certainly about Michael. Michael, welcome. Tell us more about yourself. Well, I mean, where to start? Um, uh, yeah, so um, as you said, I've, I've had a career in tech and noble change, but whenever I say that, I'm never entirely sure what it means. It's just like... I've had a career trying to, I've been lucky enough to have this career where I've been asked to do some difficult things and, and all those difficult things are really about how how companies um, change the way that they do stuff. And along the way in doing that, I've probably got more things wrong than I have right, but it means that I've kind of had the opportunity to learn and change the way that I think and do things along the way. And what is technology? What's the technology element? Can you, can you give us some examples of the kind of stuff that you have been doing over the years? I guess it's one of those um, one of those myths, I suppose, which is oh, we want to change something. We know something doesn't work here. What do we do? I know what we do. Let's buy a piece of technology. That'll sort it. Um, and what you need for that piece of technology, we need somebody to manage that. And that was kind of how I ended up with this accidental job as like a, a, a manager doing technology change. And what I realized pretty quickly, although probably slower than I should have done, is... It's, it's an obvious thing to say, but it's people that make technology work. It's got nothing to do with the technology at all. And usually it's it's the other way around. People do technology first and think about the people second. And the accidental secret of my success was was doing the opposite, which was thinking about the people and then thinking about the technology. When I was at Network Rail, we did some really weird stuff. I spent eight years at Network Rail. Like we started to think about what if we called gave systems people's names and we treated them like we were onboarding a a new employee and things like that just completely changing the way that you think about it but um that that was why and it also the great thing about being in technology was um it gives you license to to mess about with the whole of the process which means that you've got to mess about with the whole of the organization because nothing ever exists in isolation um so yeah, that's what I really mean by technology. So even though I'm kind of a technologist, there's no there's no such thing as an IT project really. They're all just people project. So tell us a little bit more about uh, which career path you followed and what has led you to your your latest your latest venture, your latest move. So my latest, if I start my latest move, I I kind of I quit what I think was probably my dream job. And if you said, what's 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 your dream job? Like I worked, I was a director at a big four consultancy. So, you know, great badge, all of the trimmings that you would expect. And um, what it helped me to spot was, um, I like crime novels. So, you know, in a really good Agatha Christie novel, 
you get to the end of it and let's say Poirot unveils it and suddenly you realise that there's all of these little breadcrumbs being dropped through the whole of the book and it all makes sense. So, But it's never a surprise. You never unveil something that wasn't shown to you in chapter one. So that's kind of how it's felt. And now I sit here, I realise I've been connecting the dots. Um, and the dots really started um, when I started school. That was like the first breadcrumb. And um, I, I, my mum would be very pleased I'm talking about this, by the way, but I loved Winnie the Pooh completely obsessed by Winnie the Pooh. And I don't know if you remember this bit in Winnie the Pooh when he starts school, he's got to say goodbye to his friends. So he's saying goodbye to his friends. And that's, I when I started school, I said goodbye to some of my friends. And that meant that that was my way of kind of fitting into a school, school life. And the friends that I said goodbye to, I think are, you know, understanding this, that humans are naturally different. Um, and they prosper when their talents are celebrated and encouraged. And the engine of achievement might sound a funny way of putting it is is curiosity. So that, like that's the only thing I think any anything gets done is is through curiosity. And also, you know, if you see people like kids playing in between lessons and even the best teams, what do they look like? They they're like full of curiosity. They collaborate really well. They're super engaged, like the joy is inevitable in the right environment. And I guess the, the main bit was, and we've all encountered this, which is like time really flies when, you, when, you, when you're having fun. And they were like, that's my first breadcrumb, which was leaving all these bits behind and getting this like, I, you know, I'm writing the story after the event, but getting this almost visceral shock around, oh my God, what am I, so I'm supposed to sit here and like, absorb all this information and regurgitate it once a year. And if I can do that really well, then I'm I'm clever and I can go and get a good job and have a house and get and all of that stuff. And I I listened way too late. And I know this is like a very long winded way of answering answering it. But like if I look back in it, there's all these little breadcrumbs. Like I failed my GCSEs, but because I thought, well blimey, if I just try a bit harder, I'll probably be all right. So I retook them and it didn't really make much difference. But at one breadcrumb is I got an A in ceramics because you had to choose. You had to choose. I think it was four GCSEs to finish with. Um, sorry, to reset. And I thought I'll just do ceramics, and I got an A in ceramics. Um, and the breadcrumb is oh, maybe you like messing around and creating and doing things with your hands. And then I failed my A levels, and I didn't get a place in medical school. And the only place would have me was uh, Sunderland, where I studied economics. Sorry, Colin. Um, but and you know, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a, I had a, I had an absolute whale of a time actually. But I sort of forgot everything that I learned there and went right. I better go and get a proper job now. And I spent this whole time, sort of ignoring, uh, ignoring all of these messages, ignoring these breadcrumbs. And I got to the position where I'm, you know, forty eight, um, and recognizing there's quite a privilege to being able to make a big change in your life you've got like it's a big risk and not everybody can take it so just want to put that out there at the moment but um it, it feeling like not even like a choice it's feeling like absolutely something that i can no longer ignore and if i did ignore it would it would make me miserable for the rest of my life. It, you know, I think if I look back on it, it had made me miserable, but it got to the point at which that, you know, it was just making me um, like clinically miserable. The thing that I found most difficult through my career is, it sounds really obvious, is meetings. Um, and I had this sense that, all right, I know meetings is where like work is supposed to take place. Um, but am I the only one who thinks that nothing actually happens and we spend an awful lot of time doing nothing? And I, I kind of realised that there are some people like meetings, but most people don't like meetings. So this sounds really simple, what I'm doing now, which is that I became very obsessed with design thinking and taking some of the bits from digital product design and putting those into a collaboration environment. Um, so and if you think about what digital product design did, it took, you know, 
it took delivery life cycles from software for month from months and months and months to days. And they did that basically by putting developers at the heart of who they were developing stuff with. In essence, there's more to it than that. Um, so that's what I'm doing now is I'm applying those into effectively loaded work workshopping techniques to very quickly take over people's meetings and kind of do three things. I'm trying not to sound like one of your previous guests, guests, but like what actually is going on here and what are our biggest challenges and opportunities? Um, do we all agree that they're the biggest challenges and the opportunities? Because we've all been in meetings where everyone goes, yes, 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 definitely agree with that. And then the second the door opens, everyone goes, what load of nonsense that was. And that's corrosive. That destroys like anything that you do. And um, at the risk of going off a tangent is when I was running projects, what I noticed was that they always went wrong straight away, but you didn't notice until it was too late. So that's what I'm really trying to do is stop people going wrong straight away. And how do you do that? You align around what the actual problem is. You get some consensus around what the problem is. You get people to understand everybody else's perspective about to, on that problem, you know, get some understanding and some empathy. You quickly have a, have a look around to what solutions you've got. And guess what? Most of the solutions have been invented before, but done by somebody else. Um, the other thing that's kind of obvious, but you have to experience it is there's never one solution. You know, in the same way that there's no, there's like not one perfect cup of tea. Everybody likes their tea differently or coffee or whatever it is. That's an important realisation because generally, as senior leaders, you're told you've got to know what you're doing. You've got to have one opinion that's unmovable and, and make it happen. Um, and at the end of it, fundamentally, decide what you're going to do about it. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do, what I'm, I'm trying to revolutionise meetings and through that, help people basically like their job a bit more. So do you find that um, organizations realize that meetings, A, that their meetings are probably not particularly effective uh, and, 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 and B, that, that can, that's important to change? My, my belief is they have a sense of it. So when I come in and say that this basically doesn't cost you anything, that the, the most and my signature move is this thing called a one hour sprint. I go, worst case, you 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 waste an hour of your life. That's worst case. Um, people tend to buy that. So I, I think people have a nagging sense that there's there's a problem and things need to change. But um my firm belief is that like knowing something and doing it is actually really difficult. Um having someone help you experience it is a much easier way to to seeing that there's a different way of doing things. What I'm trying to prescribe is a mechanism that you can understand each other better, have some more things in your toolbox to, to collaborate. Because after all, back to what I was saying previously, is um, in the right conditions, all of the stuff that I'm talking about, it just happens naturally. You know, innovation, curiosity, inverted commas, risk-taking. All I'm trying to do is, is help you create the right environment and the conditions for that to happen. The, the issue... With, with meetings is, um, I don't know, sort of, it's, it's, it's deep within organisations. They can't see the problem, even if it's, you know, hitting them in the face. So we've seen that as they're moving towards hybrid and they're moving towards, well, they should be trying to move, well, they are sort of, should be moving towards more asynchronous methods of communication, which, which, which paradoxically makes meetings even more important because they're less frequent. Yeah. Less frequent. Um, they just carry on having more meetings. So they, but they just now have them all on Zoom. And in fact, meetings have increased. And yeah, they're still getting less. And they're still, and they're saying, oh, it's because we're all on Zoom. It's, it's not because you're all on Zoom. It's because you think meetings are where the work gets done and you don't run them in a way that gets the work done. And, yeah. And it has parallels with what you said about productivity because the way that productivity is measured is simplistic and belongs to the industrial age. And we're now in a complex knowledge environment and it's meaningless to take you know output or or revenue and divide it by hours and say that's the productivity it's just utterly pointless i think um i think there's value in that and the reason why there's there's value in talking about productivity and by the way i'm looking at ben here i know you can't see i'm looking at like we bear the scars of this but <laughs> um 
it is an important measure for if only because people understand it as an important measure and it's kind of a bit like you, you know as a country we're a bit obsessed with gdp well of course that's an important measure but it can't be the only measure so what what i would much prefer is a again back to the toolbox if you can get people thinking about oh what other things what other things can we can we start to measure and, and understand that add nuance to that productivity measure the the hybrid work thing is such a uh, so confusing to me because it seems so obvious that like well, activity isn't productivity. So if you just go activity isn't productivity, what's the best way of doing our work and what's the best place of doing it, do, that you do it? Well, that's just solved this hybrid working problem. You know, the, the, the fact that there's so many meetings and everybody's disengaged and, you know, if you believe Gallup, 17% of people say that they don't do anything that they're interested in. That's not, that's not because of where they are. It's, it's more fundamental than that. Yeah, I'm... I'm... I'm also intrigued by the, the the transition that you're at, Michael, going into this new chapter. And um yeah, it's it it seems like from from a distance a, a deeply unusual thing to do. <laughs> you know, so you're going from a place where you are, you know, you have a an an exalted role in a in a in a prestigious organization and you you have turned your back on that and then you said no i i just want to help people sort their meetings out (laughs) and i think it's brilliant because i know you well i completely understand um some of the yeah you do (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well why don't why don't you have a go why didn't why didn't why 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 don't you have a go at just describing why that is so purposeful and have so much meaning for you right now i'd be really interested just to just to hear where, where you're at that i think there were there are more than two components but i was going to say there are two components of it thing number one was this um unavoidable realization that I was, and I was going to say we, I don't want to say anybody else, but I guess this is very familiar. We plan for our happiness to be somewhere else. And I think mine was in retirement. So like, I'm going to do this for another 10 years and then I can spend, I can be happy. And, um, and I, and I'm, if I mentioned the, um, hedonic adaptation if if your listeners or you haven't heard it there's loads of studies on it the most compelling one that i read which was another breadcrumb was they took lottery winners and people who've just been put in a wheelchair from an accident measured their happiness they obviously were very different in terms of their happiness at that moment but in a years later they went and revisit them and they were basically the same level of happiness so whatever situation that you're in you adapt to and i found myself and I actually had a really interesting time in management consultancy, but like I I, I felt a little bit like um, I was in some kind of accidental simulation test, which is where they went, if we put someone like Michael in this, what's going to happen? Um, so I always, I never felt like I adjusted to it properly. And what I realized was um, I, I often find that I'm motivated by a different set of things than people around me, but I felt it especially so there. So I would find myself sat in meetings. It it always comes back to meetings because that's where it is for me thinking. um, In fact, if I can tell you a little story here, this, this, this says it all. We were doing like an all hands and there was sort of 200 people in the room and they had this bit where you had to stand up in your row and you had to find something in common. And it was sort of 10 seconds of silence uh, and someone said, you know, do you want to go first, Michael? And I said, have we all got the crushing sense that we're wasting our lives in this meeting? <laughs> and, and and they all looked at me like, no. <laughs> but So I sort of realised that, like, I've got to do something about this because I'm going to make myself, like, really miserable. And But as a component of that is this, that's thing number one, but thing number two was um, I, I was tired all the time. 
like all the time. Um, I thought I had long COVID. I had like all kinds of barrages of test, tests and everything. And long story short, uh, the last thing that I, I had was I had a test for ADHD and they said, yes, you've got ADHD after it. And there's a very long process for that. And then they also said, oh, by the way, you've got nine of the 10 characteristics for autism. So go and get tested for that. And they said, yes, you've got those. And suddenly it was like, if if I, I've, I've, I now realize that I've got a brain that's wired for interest, but also one that's quite sensitive to boredom and inverted commas overstimulation. So I've, I, I just have no option now but to go and find something that fits the way that I think. And if I can just say one more thing about that, because I think it's really important is um, I really like cooking. Cooking is one of the things that I really like. And when you get to be a good cook, you can open your spice drawer and you open your cupboard and you go, right, I know what to make now. So like, um, I'm going to add these five combinations of herbs and I'm going to heat it at this amount. It's like, I, I think I'm a little pot of herbs. So brilliant in certain dishes, but actually quite disruptive when inverted commas running organizations. And when I've run them really well, which I think I have, I've done it in quite a disruptive way. And the most disruptive thing is, and, and Bell, Ben will understand this because we spent the first few months basically arguing with each other, is I really don't like being told what to do. So if I'm told to do something, I'll kind of do it in my own way. When you've got enough autonomy and freedom, brilliant stuff happens. When you haven't, bad stuff happens. And, and it made me like... It's not an exaggeration to say being in that constrained environment, because that's what like a lot of people live in. It may, it was starting to make me ill. In fact, it made me ill. Sounds familiar, Colin? I can. I was about to. I can completely resonate with that. So I was describing to you earlier. You know, I had to. I sort of classify my career in BT as being half of it was a playground and the other half was a prison, and it was exactly that. That in the first half, you know, I was a herb that suited the dish because it was um, a bit spicy, I suppose. And <laughs> um, and uh, it was all about, you know, innovation and collaboration and we were doing new stuff. And then we got sucked into this other part of the organisation uh, where they preferred much bland affair, I suspect. Uh, and so, you know, my, my spiciness did not go down very well at all. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it, yeah, it did. It, it, it did a, I ended up getting quite damaged by the whole process, but... Um, you know, at least you had the awareness to, to tell what it was. Well, it sounds like you actually got quite sick before you realised yeah. what the cause was. But um... I'm, I'm kind of, it sounds a bit weird. I'm kind of grateful for it because, and I go back to school, I, I, because school's where it all started for me in, in my, in kind of my head. If somebody said to me, look, this is just not for you, Michael. Like that just, it's not I know you're planning on going to university and you're planning all of these things, but like, just really have a think about what it is that you want to do. Um, because here are the things that you're brilliant at and they don't correspond with what you're trying to do. That would have really helped me. And and the last role that I had, that it, it just was so obvious that I wasn't going to ever fit in and the organisation wasn't going to allow me uh, to by the way when I say allow me I don't mean like I completely wasn't exploited or anything like that just but it just it was so inflexible um and not even that it it for me to fit in it needs to I need to basically design everything for myself and basically do what I want to do and most organizations aren't going to allow you to do that but I'm not the only one there are you know there are millions of people who feel like this and even the millions of people who don't feel like this would work much better and much happier in an environment where they had autonomy and control over the way that they did their work. Cause like, that's what it's all about. Having, having a bit more joy at work and getting some good stuff done is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So for some, for some people, and, and I think both of you, Colin and Michael, perhaps fall into that category, uh, becoming almost ill or, or definitely ill is, is the moment that helps you decide that actually I need, I need a clean break. I need to really do something radical here in order to 
yeah, stay healthy, survive, make the most of my life. I only got one uh, one of those, of course, uh, to play with. So th this this is uh, this is the moment to take drastic action. Um, for others, um, it it may follow a different route, but still towards some radical decision. I mean, Ben, did did that happen for you, or were you is you, has your career been more meandering gently? My career has yeah or um, yeah it's been it's it's been happen chance mainly um you know i didn't know that i that i would fall in love with a career in organizational effectiveness organizational change and development whatever la label you prefer until i was literally thrown in at a deep end in 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 the middle of a in the middle of a, a, a project by way of a secondment um, and I knew within weeks that uh, there was no way I was going to go back to, you know, being a, you know, an infrastructure project manager, which is what mm. I'd done before. And I loved it. There's no, you know, the day I accepted the, the secondment, I thought, well, I'll try this. I probably won't like it. And I'll soon be back doing what I really love. And within weeks, I knew there was no going back. I'd, 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 I'd seen um i'd seen i'd seen the challenge i'd experienced some of the rewards from from doing it and i knew i knew there was no going back yeah but just just coming back to that how debilitating the the constraints and and, and the order were you know M michael and i worked together for uh an organization i was a consultant mike michael was inside it and we really battled to get anything going at all for months if we're both being honest mm -hmm. and then we persuaded uh the head honcho to give us a big slice of the country like the whole of the south um and to run an experiment and and, and what we did actually um this so this is you know, this is 2010 what we actually did was apply the Burtzorg model without knowing about the Burtzorg model. And maybe the Burtzorg model wasn't famed at all at that, at that stage, but, but, but we had some willing, a willing leader in that, in that geography. Uh, and we just started combining some really rich, insightful data that the technology was giving us, but putting the people on the front line in charge of what they want to do with it to change and improve the way they work and then we started not just getting results but then we started really having fun uh, and and finding really deeply rewarding work because the people around us were finding deeply rewarding work but that first six months where you're trying to get human change hearts and minds in the framework of a gantt chart and a program and linear you know thinking was quite torturous, I think, for both of us. There are two, there are two standout moments for me in the context of, of of this, which I think are important. Is that was another time that I was again hauled over the court coals for not being firm and strong enough. Um, because, I, and I, I I have this view, and I would now phrase it like this: If you tell people what to do, the best you're going to get is what you tell them to do. So I've, I've I've kind of always been very resistant around telling people what to do, because I think if you, you know, people know what they're doing in general. If you let them get on with it, they might do some things that surprise you. The thing that was really revolution for me, that that project is definitely one of my moments. And there were there are two things that spring to mind. We I think it was Ben who actually worked out the actual productivity and and. Uh, I went to my boss, who was the MD, and said what it was. And he said, I can't tell, tell it. I can't say this. I can't say this. So I I wrote this thing, which I now consider to be a stroke of genius, called a secondary scorecard. And the secondary scorecard is the one that he showed his boss and his execs. And it was all completely made up. But because we knew we were focusing on the things that matter and things were going in the right direction, he was fine to talk about it. I want to go back to the sort of the career change um, moment and and range of motivations, I suppose that that people may have, and uh, I don't think I've I've shared it here in in this forum. Um, 
but I used the first half of my career was in banking. The second half of my I had a, a year out, and in that year, I reflected on: Do I want to be like my dad and have the same employer for my entire working life? Uh, answer being no. Uh, but blimey, uh, I've already been working with them now for fifteen years. So if I want to change what I'm doing, then I better uh, get a move on. Uh, and during that year off, um, I came to the conclusion, now I want to do something that's more impactful, um, apply my my energy and the few talents that I have in a, in a different way and see, see if I can make an impact uh, in a different way. And especially because in banking, I never even saw a client. I, I was the support staff of the support staff. Um, so I never ever spoke to a client or see one, even not even from a distance. So uh, it was it was quite a, a realization when when we invited a client to an internal conference once, just to have someone up there speak about uh, how they perceived what it was that we were doing. Anyway, that's an aside. The, the thing though that that career change moment um, that I struggled with initially is the one that okay, so you you're. In my case, you were a quote unquote banker and now you want to become a something completely different. In my case, a social entrepreneur. Um, so how do you reinvent yourself? How do you uh, become credible? How do you, um, if anything, rewrite your CV? Because your CV is a banking CV. How do you uh, build a new network? Because your network is all about bankers. Um, so I just wondered, uh, uh, how, how, how did you guys experience that? And, um, did you, did you not have that problem perhaps, or, or, and if, or if you did, how did you, um, deal with it? I, uh, um, can I go first just while I'm thinking about it? Cause, uh, the, for me, it started in a slightly different place. And this sounds, one of the things you mentioned is how do you, how do you, get people to take lower paid jobs. Um, what I realized when I, poverty is miserable, makes you miserable. But there comes a point at which every penny that you earn, I earned, took me away from doing the things that I actually really loved. And what I realized is that if you look at sort of any longitudinal study and what do people say at the end of their lives, None of them ever say, blimey, I wish I'd spent more time at work. What they what they tend to say is, and the people are healthiest, they exercise, they hang out with their friends, they do things that are interesting, et cetera, et cetera. And what I realized was, if I want to be happy, ignore work for one moment, because I'll get onto that point. I have to fundamentally change the way that I work. And the happiness component within work is not money. Um, it you've got to have enough to subside and not be poor, but it's not money. And I was well into and had been well into diminishing returns for ages. So that was my way into it, which is like, actually, the conventional wisdom is kind of walk your way into it and work out what you want to do and kind of do that. But I didn't do that. I just went, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take the plunge now and hope for the best, knowing that, not even knowing, believing that, it would kind of work out and that I didn't know how to reinvent myself and I still don't quite know how to reinvent myself or, or describe what I do. But the only way that I'm going to be going to do that is just to do it. So as a, as a probably a poor example is I've always loved writing. So I've started writing a sub stack. It's like, how do you get good at writing? How do you get good at writing? Well, you just do loads of it. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do, which is that I'm trying to reinvent. And as I as I do it, like, what is Michael? I'm going to write that bit down. That That is the bit. And when kind of I talk to people and they go, I don't know what you're talking about, Michael. We have a talk about, like, what do you actually mean? Oh, I'll write that down. Um, what is it that you're trying to do? Well, we'll have a talk about, oh, I'll write that down. And that, that way you start to construct kind of a a brand horrible word but you know what I mean you construct a brand and you have a way of explaining it and you kind of navigate your way into it I think it's probably quite an unconventional approach where you're supposed to do all things systematically but like it it feels quite <laughs> it feels good that's what I would say it feels good I, I think that that so you're right I mean the, the, you know the, the advice is to do things 
you know, systematically or whatever. But of course, that's that's people rewriting their history of how they made the transition and putting it into that nice, neat, linear structure that we all like, you know, 10 steps to get out of your corporate hellhole into self-employment bliss. Um, and uh, it's, it, life isn't really like that at all. Uh, and, and that's so, so that's a that's sort of like a category error or whatever. Um, and, I, and I always remember when, when, this, I, when I started getting into this area, I, I did some research around, um, you know, career transitions and stuff. And there was a story of this guy who'd, um, it's, it was quite amusing. It was about he'd starting up, he started up a business for, uh, what's he called it, male, uh, male discreet grooming products. Okay. Yeah. So, so these are grooming products for your bits down there. Yeah. Uh, and okay. other parts, other other parts uh, that are not very pleasant. Um, and and so was, that was what that was what is in the article because it's quite funny. It's quite you know sort of a bit ooh misses. Um, but when you looked into it, he'd actually been a uh, top ad guy at one of the big agencies. So you know, first of all, he had the creative, you know, ideas. Secondly, he had a fantastic network of all the sorts of people he'd need to do that. Mm. Thirdly, he was financially secure. You know, so this is like that's not where most people are. Right, mm. most people are stuck in you know stuck in an office in an office block in Slough, thinking well, what's going on with my life. Um, mm. I'm wondering how they're going to make the next mortgage payment. So it, it's not about. I think I've only recently come to realize this. It's not so much about reinventing yourself. It's not so much about a transition. In fact, as human beings, we are, and you know, and we know this as children, we are in the act of becoming. We are continually reinventing and transitioning and developing. Mm. And I think what what happens and why you got to that moment and why you know we all went through that sort of phase is when you get in that corporate environment, you stop becoming it's actually halted because it's it's not advantageous you're supposed to conform yeah. you're supposed to you know follow the norms you know if you do anything unusual you get criticized like you did like i did i got you know like, and there's yeah and, and and as you find out if you continually stick your head over the parapet and somebody tries to shoot it off you stop doing it after a while and, and you lose that part of becoming of yourself and so actually what you're doing is going back to you know and what we've all done is sort of try to get back to that previous state of of always being yeah. so so it is about discovery it is about trying stuff out seeing what works you know trying what you can against the wall and seeing what sticks but that label is quite <laughs> sticky though isn't it i mean that label and and you call it uh, um, a product of corporate life but i think uh it goes beyond corporate life i think it's it's also it doesn't really matter whether you work for a big corporate and whether that's a benevolent or a or, or not kind of corporate it could be a, a charitable organization for for all i care or or uh or it could be the public sector um it's the fact that you at some point or another you acquire a label and that's how whether you identify yourself like that other people identify you like that and to escape from that label is quite hard mm -hmm. uh, um it, so it, it it is even uh, your your partner might see you as you but you're you know you're the bt man colin aren't you uh you know you're you like to tinker with technology uh, th th that's who you are why would you want to become you know uh, someone who helps people work in a completely different way so it's it's these powers also that play a role in that process of changing yeah. and becoming and developing yourself into into your next phase and and therefore to uh, first of all to acknowledge that is is helpful i think um and then to to try and find some tactics and uh, and, and little tricks perhaps for uh, i don't want to stick big words on it like strategies uh, to come away from that a little bit bit by bit is is um is not necessarily easy, but it's, it's important to begin to develop that new. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I mean, there's there's all sorts of social conditioning that that yeah. that, is, that are also constraints, and and there'll be your people near and dear to you that want to hold you where you are because yeah. they, they they are scared that if you go to be somebody else, you know, that they'll lose out in that 
process somehow. But but I, I think I think this actual I mean the actual pain that that you feel that gets you to that point of no I have to do something different now mm. is the fact that you are no longer becoming. You yeah. just you've you just you stop developing, you stop growing as a person. Nobody really cares what you do. Like if you're lucky, are you lucky if they even know? So I think I, I had put a lot of my own kind of image and value into this thing that nobody knew or cared about. And and realising that was quite liberating. But there's a catch-22, which is if I say, what what's the thing that I'm looking for? I, I'm looking for freedom or, and, and autonomy. Unless, the way that I, unless I change the way that I think about that, I'm just trading one uh, one machine for another machine and I'm never going to escape. Um, and I remember listening just as I was thinking about quitting. Um, I was amused that it's called work punks, by the way, because I used to love, in fact, still do punk music. And I was listening to Rage Against the Machine and they were like, when they came out, I was like, oh my God, someone has written some music just for me. And then I was thinking, it wasn't like washing machine, was it? They weren't raging against the bread machine. They were raging against the corporate machine. But and I, and I definitely got myself into that that place. But it doesn't actually get you anywhere because you can never escape that rage. For me, I had to move myself into like into a different way of thinking about everything before I could change what I did for a living. And um, it was that way around. That's what I'm trying to poorly articulate, which is like I didn't change my job. I changed the way that I thought, which meant that, like, actually, it was quite easy to change the thing that I do because suddenly the things that I thought were important were no longer important and it just became really obvious to go and do something else. It wasn't because I thought I'm going to try and do the same things for myself as I was doing in previous organisations. It was like a completely different mindset shift. I I completely get that. Change the way that you think. and And... For me, just as our careers meander, I think your purpose evolves over time. And, you know, I had a very strong sense of purpose when I first founded um, our consultancy way, way back when, 2006. Um, and really, it's just it's it's always been perfect purpose led. But that North Star has 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 shifted. And um like many of us, I had no idea how I was going to make this change work, but I knew I couldn't, and I knew I couldn't, you know, plan and think my way to do it. I had to experiment to do it and uh, to uh, and, and allow it to evolve. Just catching catching up with with the purpose, um, and that's and that's absolutely kind of of where it is. So um, yeah, I. I um, I, I'm really interested to see um, how Michael's new chapter will evolve. Maybe we'll get you back on in 18 months' time and um, and and hear about how the experiments are going. So on that note, uh, Michael, thank you very much for your contribution today. A fascinating story, and uh, and um, like Ben said, uh, I think there the, there would have there could have been a lot, an awful lot more we could have been talking about. Uh, but perhaps something for a future episode. So good luck with changing organizations through the power of meetings and uh, good luck with uh, where your new career takes you. Um, thanks everybody for watching us on this episode or listening to us. We hope that you will join us next time. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.